Thank you and good morning. It is uh, Thursday, September 17th. This is a joint committee meeting with House Health Care and Senate Health and Welfare. Uh, so this morning we're going to take testimony and hear from, uh, get a report, uh, an update from Chara Chesbro and Shayla Livingston of the Department of Health on some of the use of stabilization funds for uh, within the diversity programs. And then we will be moving on to other areas of the Agency of Human Services with Sarah Clark and Ina Backus and looking at those, the distribution and use of those stabilization funds. So um, Shayla, I see that you're here and Sarah, so welcome. Thank Hello. you so much. I'm gonna let okay. Sarah um, take it away. Good morning. Um, thanks everyone for having me back. My name is Sarah Chesbro. I'm the, um, the equity technical coordinator for our health operations center at the health department. Um, I testified a couple of weeks ago with, um, with House Healthcare about our decisions around the coronavirus relief funding. And I wanna thank you so much for all your attention to funding, you know, designating funding to uh, mitigate health disparities. It's such important work and I'm glad we have your support. Um, I think that I'm here today, um, I can give updates on the current awards that are out or going out. Um, I can also answer questions about the supplemental money that is being considered. Um, I don't have a report or presentation, but I'm just here for questions if it's helpful. Okay. Um, are there questions from any members of the committees at this point? Uh, I would like to hear just a quick update, if you don't mind, of uh, where we are and how much of the money has been expended, and then uh, also the consideration for. I'd like to hear about the supplemental as well, if you don't mind. So a quick, a quick update. Absolutely, and I, I might pivot to uh, Chair Lippert to explain a little bit more about the what's being considered with the supplemental funding, but um, the the half billion dollars that. Um, that was funneled our way in, let's see, that was July, um, <clears throat> is going to be all spent on five different awards and House Healthcare has, has heard this already, so I'll be brief. Um, the funding is, um, is to mitigate health disparities during COVID for, um, for different subpopulations that, that experience them or are experiencing um, some adverse outcomes currently. Um, so funding is going to um, Spectrum Family Services, um, passing through to Dr. Avila, um, who, is, who actually testified with me last time, um, an expert on health disparities, and she runs a program called Cultural Brokers. She'll be doing um, needs assessments, focus groups, training, um, and a lot of community work with her cultural brokers. The concept here being that community health workers are the best way for the health department to interact with um, communities in need, some of whom speak English as, as a second language, um, or have other um, limitations and are, are marginalized. Um, so the, that funding will support uh, refugee and new American populations statewide. Um, other funding is going to support um, migrant worker advocacy agencies, Bridges to Health, which is part of UVM Extension, and Open Door Clinic, which serves migrant workers in Addison County. So with those two awards, mm -hmm. that'll serve um, migrant farm workers and employers in our state. Um, and then the, Two remaining awards are to United Ways, one in Wyndham County and one in Rutland County. Um, those organizations are also acting as pass-throughs to their uh, social service providers who serve um, folks experiencing disparities. Um, so among those are um, racial and ethnic minorities, refugee and new Americans, LGBTQ+, um, people experiencing poverty or living in rural areas. Um, and then I think what's being considered um, is the awarding of, of um, more money to specifically target um, some populations in geographic regions that weren't reached in the first round of funding. Um, I might pause and see if anyone from House, House Healthcare has updates there or questions for me. This was in the, uh, in the budget, Bill. Representative Lippert. Yes, uh, we, uh, the House Healthcare Committee recommended an additional million dollars be uh, right. allocated of CRF dollars um, to health disparities, 
particularly focusing on continuing to focus on community BIPOC communities, uh, people of color, as well as LGBTQ youth, uh, mental health system survivors, uh, peer issues, uh, which did not seem to be uh, fully addressed in the initial round. And uh, actually some members of your committee are on appropriations and they may, I understand that they, the Senate has made some changes in the language there. I haven't had right. a chance to catch yeah. up. Completely. Yeah, they have. I, I read it all uh, last night, but so and I think rather than go into the budget right now, I think right. we ought to just ask questions of I agree. stabilization dollars. Uh, you mentioned you'd receive $500,000. I believe the recommend from um, Human Services and Health and Welfare and Healthcare Committees was 700,000 that made it into the budget. So I don't know what happened to the other 200,000. And that's a question for you, Sarah, if you know the answer. I, oh, sorry. I'm not, I don't think I'm able to answer that question. I don't know about the, uh, the amount okay. of funding that's being considered. Okay. Um, I think Senator Lyons, we were, we in, we were, assured that there was additional dollars in a special grant, an epi epidemiological grant that the Department of Health had where they were going to make some additional grant awards. Mm -hmm. I don't believe those awards have been made at this point. That's right. That's the ELC money at the health department. Right, but that's not the, uh, that's not the appropriation that was made, uh, the 200,000 other dollars that was made. So that, that's still, it's still out there. I will, see what happens. We'll have to ask a question of uh, the secretary to see perhaps what uh, the thoughts are there. Unless, Shayla, you can add additional information. How are the, how are the, how is I the have money? no additional information, sorry. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, Sarah, just one other question that I have, and that is, how are the funds being distributed? Is this an RFP process, um, or have you simply um, look to see. Mm -hmm. who, the who previous, yeah, yeah. Uh, the previous selection, we did not choose to do an RFP. We have to submit a, um, a, an application to the agency of administration to say exactly how we plan to spend this money and how we're making our decisions. Um, this time around, if there are supplemental funds awarded, I think we would, we would review that process again with our business office and, um, potentially do an RFP. Um, I'm not sure at this point, but uh, the previous funds were made based on um, surveying our district office staff, um, our district directors and the offices of local health, um, and doing some statewide scanning of racial and social justice organizations, trying as much as possible to get a good geographic spread. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, Representative Page has a question. Yes. Um, I was curious, and I think we brought this up last time, what other geographical areas are you considering, such as other remote areas of the state? Not just the Northeast Kingdom, but mm -hmm. throughout the state remote areas, because these categories that you did mention are important, but they're not, they're not just important for Burlington or Rutland, they're important for all of our rural areas. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I absolutely agree. Um, I think we can we can provide more attention to geographic spread and we'll, you know, the thing is that having to do a needs assessment takes time. So I'm not sure I'll work with Shayla to figure out exactly how we'll, um, how we'll know where the need is for these, um, for these populations. I will say that um, part of what we have to consider is uh, organizations that serve these populations that are well established and, you know, have good relationships with their community. So we'll be looking for you know, those service organizations um, and, and to find out what their capacity is and who they serve. Okay, other questions? I'll just make one comment and then I think we do need to move on because I, but uh, in conversations with the Department of Health, uh, I think we need to recognize that there's a bit of a c circular issue here that if you don't have well-established organizations because in fact you haven't been able to grant them monies previously and then you conclude that they can't receive monies because they're not well-established, it's just a circular argument of, uh, and I think an evidence of what syst systemic issues uh, 
And so uh, I have had some conversations with the Department of Health about this issue. Uh, I don't think we should get, try to get into them this morning. Very good. Thank you. Uh, maybe we'll have some time next week. Okay. We um, any other questions? <clears throat> because I agree we should move on uh, to Ina and Sarah. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Appreciate your time and the thank update. Thank you very much. Uh, keep us posted. All right. Sheila, okay. thank you. Thanks, Good to see you. Okay. All right. So, um, I think Sarah, you and Ina are the point people on the report for us. And why don't you just uh, take it away? And I will, uh, Representative Page, your hand is still raised. So you may want to take it down unless you have another question. Great. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Thank you for having us. I just, uh, Commissioner Gustafson is also available as we move through the presentation and the updates. For your I was, I was going to give him a day off, but <laughs> you, we'll, we'll, we'll make him work. Um, I sent over, we sent over this morning two different documents. One is a PowerPoint presentation that continues broader updates across all of the agency CRF programs. Today we can focus on healthcare stabilization. In addition, we sent over um, a detailed listing of the healthcare stabilization awards that have been issued and paid to date. So I will go ahead and share my screen. And we'll jump into the presentation. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Great. Okay, so Thank just you. as a reminder, we're here today talking about the $275 million appropriation to the Agency of Human Services for the Healthcare Provider Stabilization Grant Program. As these committees are aware, AHS, working in partnership with the Agency of Digital Services, stood up a Salesforce application to help us facilitate this grant process. The applications opened on July 17th and closed on August 15th. A broad array of healthcare and human service providers are eligible for the program. AHS is administering this program in two different cycles. The first cycle, as I just referred to, closed on August 15th, and it covers the time period March 1st, 2020 to June 15th, 2020. HS is actually in the process right now of preparing for a second cycle of application that will likely be open to applicants in October. It will cover the time period March 1st, 2020 through September 15th, 2020. As a reminder to this com these committees, the legislation um, required AHS to develop a needs-based application process. Conditions of the grant funding are that the grant funds have to be spent by December 30th of 2020. The funds have to be used to cover cost and lost revenue associated with the coronavirus um, with COVID-19 pandemic. All of these grants are subject to single audit. And where applicable, provider organizations must continue their current participation in value-based payment initiatives through 2021. Can I ask a question here? Um, uh, how, uh, you said that there are, the notice is being sent out to workforce, to the workforce. How extensive is that? I mean, it goes beyond folks who are currently in um, the all payer model. Uh, the, it goes to all practitioners is what I'm thinking. Is that accurate? Ina, can I defer to you for that question? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. The, the question is how, how are providers becoming aware of the opportunity? Yes. The, the providers, this is a broad array of providers that are eligible for this grant opportunity it is by no means only eligible, uh, including only eligible providers who are, are participating in payment reform. Um, the, the spectrum of providers includes um, even those providers that accept only private pay, uh, for instance. Mm -hmm. The 
uh, health and human services providers have all been um, made aware of this opportunity um, through various communications um, by the agency um, and the departments that have regular communications to these providers. And there's also been um, information shared through press conference and media ad advisory to make it known that this opportunity exists. There's also information available on the AHS, AHS website, as I think you are aware and have learned about those materials. Um, of course, it is those notifications that are important to drive people to the website to apply. Thank you. And we would anticipate um, with most certainly with the next cycle of application, uh, doing all of that communication that I just described again, and also communicating with any providers that have registered um, for updates uh, through our website. Okay. Thank you for that. Sorry to interrupt the flow. <laughs> Great, continuing with the presentation, AHS received roughly 351 applications from eligible providers in this first cycle of relief. Of those that applied, 78% were new to AHS relief. And what I mean by that is they didn't come through our door when we stood up in the immediate aftermath of the crisis initial relief efforts. So 78% were new, 22% had received relief previously. Applications that we received were across a broad array of provider types. Just for a point of interest, 22.7% 22 reflect dentists, which was our largest group of applicants. The pie chart that you're looking at on this slide is something that we update daily for the secretary and the leadership team to reflect where the agency is at in our review process of these 351 applications. So as of September 15th at 5 p.m., which was uh, roughly two days ago, uh, there were 42%, the green slice of the pie, where all of the reviews of the applications had been complete and were in some various state of recommendation to the secretary for grant award. 44% um, of the applications had had their second review complete and have been flagged for additional information needed from the providers that have applied through the program. This is something, as I said, that we actively monitor each day to ensure that we're making progress through all of the applications. Can you, can, uh, I'm sorry. If there's you, a question, uh, you're going to have to speak up because neither, uh, I, I, oh, it's Representative Leopard, go ahead. Uh, can, you, can you just, again, I think this is key. Can you go back that slide and say that the 42% are the review is complete, and if the review is complete, does that mean money has been distributed? Um, not necessarily, and the next, the next slide will talk about where we are in terms of uh, money going out the door. Okay, because I think it's important for us to understand what's actually happening on the ground. Yep, agreed. Okay, so big picture. Um, though we have not completed all of the application reviews, primarily because we do have some additional follow-up that is required from the applicants. Big picture, we're anticipating that this first cycle of relief payments will be in the neighborhood of $100 million. So with information that I know today, I'm going to walk you through kind of the status of funds that have gone out the door. So the first category on this slide is, um, as you're aware, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, I think was the first agency to um, stand up an economic recovery program. So as part of that, what we learned is that there were healthcare providers that were coming through that door, I think primarily because it was the first door open. And so in conversations with ACCD, because of the, um, the uh, magnitude of the healthcare stabilization program at AHS, we agreed that we would reimburse ACCD for those healthcare providers that had come through their door initially. So what you see here is roughly $1.8 million of awards that have been issued and funds that have been issued to a variety of healthcare providers through the Agency of Commerce and Community Developments programs. 
One of the detailed sheets that I provided to the committees does list um, each of those award recipients. So you'll be able to see a flavor of which organizations and how much they receive through that program. Uh, uh, Sarah, um, it, it's maybe a trivial question, but the uh, criteria for uh, making awards and the amount, uh, was that consistent with what uh, you're currently doing and you've done? with the ACCD versus AHS? Yes, so my understanding of the ACCD program, it's, it's I'd say consistent criteria, but for ACCD, I would say it's, it's more simplified and it's focused on lost revenue from 2019 to 2020. Right. Um, it also capped award amounts at $50,000. Wow. Um, and so because of the lower uh, award amount um, and the more simplified process, I think they were able to stand it up sooner and make determinations more quickly than through the healthcare stabilization program. Okay. Um, so in our program, we also take into consideration lost revenue from one year to the next, but there are other considerations that factor in our evaluation process. Uh, things like um, COVID-19 related expenses that a provider could have experienced as a result of the pandemic, we also factor in other relief that they may have received from the federal government or potentially other sources, as well as if a provider uh, may just, uh, for example, staff changes that could have resulted in savings, we, we take all of this into account in our formula to make the award determination. Uh, so one sure, last quick sure, question. It is on, consistent. What, oh, a quick question on, on that. Uh, are, is there any uh, technology included in the in the award? So, some uh, I know some docs had to purchase special equipment uh, either for themselves or their patients. Um, is that uh, is there an award provided for that, or is that not included, or does yes. that go somewhere else? <laughs> no. So, if um, if a provider had to purchase. Uh, equipment that was needed to help them deal with the pandemic, it would most certainly be an allowable uh, expense underneath our program. Thank you. Can I add one more point about the interaction between the ACCD program and ours? As you heard, the program award is capped for the ACCD program. If a provider had additional need beyond the capped amount, that provider could come through the AHS program and have that need met and acknowledged. And the provider also has the opportunity to come through the AHS program in the second cycle for additional need beyond um, June 15th of 2020. Okay, thank you. The next um, tranche of cycle one payments that I'll talk about, um, and I refer to several categories as just general healthcare providers. I use that broad terminology just to reflect it could be a whole array of non hospitals that are included there. Um, so we have issued awards and made payments in the amount of $4.3 million um, to, I believe it's roughly 90 providers. Um, in this kind of first tranche of payments that have gone out. The other detailed list of providers that I've um, given to the committee will give you the specific details on which organizations and how much funds that they have received. We are in the process today of issuing another $1.4 million of provider relief. <clears throat> um, as part of this program, I expect that we will have those awards issued and checks cut uh, by the end of the day tomorrow. There's another category um, of, for assistance to general healthcare providers of roughly $25.6 million, where their applications have been reviewed, but it's been determined that additional documentation is needed from those providers. Agency of Human Services is in the process of performing that outreach um, to be able to collect the documentation to make the final award determination. We expect for that work to be ongoing over the next week to two weeks. Um, the, so right there, so the next week to two weeks, meaning that um, potentially by the end of those two weeks, this money will have been spent. 
that yes fingers potentially crossed. it is um <laughs> A little bit more complicated because we are dependent on these organizations providing the needed documentation in order to make the awards and so we hope to be able to complete this work within two weeks but it will be contingent upon receiving the documentation we are going to try to set the standard of a five-day turnaround um, so that we can narrow the time between um, to be able to issue the awards let me ask uh, how is this timing and this work affecting the uh, next round, the getting the information out for the next round? That's a great question. Uh, we are kind of firing in all cylinders right now to be able to complete the current reviews and prepare for the next round. So we are trying to allocate resources um, to be able to complete both tasks at once. I think primarily prepping for the second round does um, though there is some kind of project management program definition that the Agency of Human Services is involved in, we are relying on our colleagues at ADS and the developer to, to do the technical portion of um, the Salesforce development that will need to be completed to make sure we're ready for the second round. Okay. And just for awareness for the committees, I think it's been, um, you know, a very collaborative effort across the Agency of Human Services. We have pulled kind of technical financial experts across all of the departments to kind of pitch in and help evaluate these proposals, these applications, because they are actually fairly technical. Um, and, you know, the, the level of knowledge to understand, let's say, profit and loss statements, um, financial backup from all of these providers is, you know, a pretty high degree. And so it's, it's been a great team building exercise. That's AHS. great. <laughs> That's actually great. <laughs> That's good. Has AHS needed or requested any additional support in order to actually complete this program? So we are, as we prepare for the second cycle, we are going to be looking outside of the agency um, for additional resources to help us complete these reviews. Um, Primarily, because we are we're relying on all different types of staff, but a lot of financial staff are participating right now. And I think, as the committees are aware, we're we're going to be embarking upon a pretty rigorous budget development cycle shortly, and so we will need uh, backup. And so we have uh, already begun those conversations to make sure we have the resources we need for the second cycle. Well, and so I believe that there were were administrative dollars in uh, CRF administrative dollars for AHS, but I don't know. I forget, uh, honestly, uh, how they might be used. So just keep us posted. Yep, yeah, will do. Yeah. Okay. Can I just say similarly with uh, what we talked about in terms of uh, moving the health disparities money out through the Department of Health, it occurred to me after the fact that we had not allocated any additional support for the administrative costs of uh, basically requiring staff to take on a whole new task while not backfilling the current needs. But let's, we'll come back to that. Okay. Yeah, I think it there there was language in the budget, but uh, I don't remember uh, exactly how it was targeted. So okay. we'll have to sort that out. The next tranche of funding I'll talk about is uh, roughly $65.6 million that will be going to hospitals uh, as part of the healthcare stabilization program. We are in the process of actually issuing awards and making payments. Um, you will see down below that I pulled out Porter by, by itself because we are still, I think we've just recently kind of finalized the inputs from that hospital and we're in the process today of actually reviewing that application and hope to be able to issue an award in the next couple of days for that hospital. So that's roughly how we get to this $98.7 million of estimated payments in the cycle one for the healthcare stabilization program. Okay. The, yeah, I have a lot of questions about the that category, but it, they're they're not necessarily related to the uh, application process as much as to where the losses have been expressed. So, for I mean, let me a quickly a question. Um, one of our goals is to have a greater integration with community services for um, mental health counseling, as an example. And I'm wondering if any of those losses are expressed within the application that we've seen. 
that you've seen? You probably can't answer that off the top of your head, but it would be interesting to, to know. I cannot. Yeah. I don't know, Ina, if you do have a sense. <laughs> I, if I understand your, your question correctly, um, I, I can answer it with that not being information that we collected through this application. We did not collect service line uh, information through okay. this application process. Okay, right, okay, get it. Thank you. All right, Sarah, I'm, uh, back to you. <laughs> Great. The, the next slide uh, that, I, that I have for you is just the depiction by hospital of the award amount. Um, and so you'll see, um, you know, across um, all of the hospitals, what the recommended award amount, not all of the hospitals did receive an award. But one of the things that we realized as part of this healthcare stabilization program is that the federal government has actually issued significant amounts of funding to healthcare providers that not only has happened in the past, but is ongoing. And so it's, it's, a, it's a challenging thing for us to estimate what the impact of that will be across the system. I think the good news is, is that we're not alone in trying to shore up the healthcare system in Vermont that our federal partners are also helping. Um, but I wanted you to have this information at a high level. So one of my questions is, is on that point exactly, because we know that there were direct grants to hospitals that we at the time were told were woefully inadequate in terms of the, the burgeoning losses. Uh, is there any kind of accounting that will be available at some point where you, as an example, particular hospital has received X millions of dollars through f other federal dollars, therefore, yeah. Uh, that needs to, as we, as the criteria are, that needs to be taken into account in terms of understanding what losses would be reimbursed through this fund. Yes, part of our funding formula is that we collect that information from not only the hospitals, but all of the providers that receive that assistance. So it is, um, you know, a component of our formula. So um, we'll be taken into consideration when we make a recommendation for the award amount. And that, that type of information would be also available to understand. So for instance, someone might, an organization might have $30 million in losses, but uh, 10 million had been reimbursed, had been re had already been paid by the federal, some, a different federal program. So therefore, uh, the amount to be considered here would be 20 million potentially. It's just an example. <laughs> yes. Is this, can I ask this question? This, this is about 200 million or, uh, I mean, $100 million for this cycle. Is this consistent at all with any estimates that had been anticipated? Because I know you had been collecting some data initially, and I'm interested in uh, actually getting to the, I think there's a projected number for the next round, and I think the projected number is I've heard, uh, but let me ask you what that projected number will be, let you present that but I think everything is less than the $275 million that had been appropriated. So maybe we can move to just get a big picture of where things might be projected to be in the next round. Sure, and what, what I will say is that we're, we're still analyzing what the next round could potentially be. It's actually very hard for us to come up with a solid estimate for the second round because I think it's obviously going to depend on the applications that we receive um, and you know hard, hard for us to kind of put a fine point on it exactly but I will say building off of your comments I think that um, based our original estimate of need roughly 275 million I think what we have seen in the first round that it's not coming in as high as we originally had anticipated I think there are several reasons for that one, we've already talked about the level of support from the federal government was greater than we were originally anticipating. Um, and that was a hard thing for us to know with certainty, um, you know, when we were building the foundations of this program. The second factor is I think utilization across the healthcare system has, has, has rebounded. Um, in, a, in a way greater than we originally expected when we were developing this program back in April. And I think that's primarily because in Vermont, we have not seen the 
the level of COVID-19 patients as we were perhaps anticipating back in the spring. And so that's good news um, for Vermont. Another factor is that um, when we designed this program, we weren't as familiar with the requirements of FEMA and organizations that are potentially FEMA eligible have to go through the FEMA portal to secure FEMA funding for roughly 75% of any of their kind of eligible COVID-19 costs. So when we had the original estimate of spending for this program, we did not take that into consideration. And so that is another factor that's kind of reducing the overall um, estimated need uh, in this program. As we look, and maybe Ina or Corey, I'll pause if you have anything else to add. I was just going to say, go ahead, Ina. Go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, for uh, as a corresponding data point, the federal government has right now, um, I believe the window's closing soon, but a Medicaid provider uh, re, um, fund available or oppor funding opportunity available, and it's an application process, and the uptake on that availability has been fairly low. So it's, and there's a little bit about, to Sarah's point about the, um, you know, there's always two things. There's always concern about taking federal money because there's always a risk and of, of it being taken back. So you wanna be very careful, which I think is also part of our, our process, which we've become more and more careful. But the second thing is just that fact that um, the system is um, functioning. We see in our Medicaid claims um, that, that it is, has rebounded um, uh, strongly now, so. I, Thank you. One final point to offer is that as we work through this program and we uh, are, are implementing the program consistent with the guidelines for the coronavirus relief funds that we understand those guidelines uh, more clearly and and that those those guidelines um, certainly do require that we execute the program in in a in particular ways um, that may be uh, limit some of the funding potential um, from what we originally estimated. Uh, a question about that as well, and then I, we've got some hands up. Um, it, can you, can you, uh, are you keeping track of the percentage of people who apply or percentage of organizations and businesses that apply for the funds as compared with those who um, have been sent a notice? So you know what the, what the uh, sort of the response has been. How many people have actually applied as compared with the number of uh, notices that have been sent out, number of people have received notices? I'm trying to get the count. So we do know that we've um, received 351 ap applications to date um, for the first phase. I would say that's a pretty small proportion relative to all of those that are potentially eligible for this program. Um, so I, yeah, I, yeah, so my, my concern has been how the complexity of the application process mm -hmm. for some of the smaller and sole proprietor type yep. businesses, independent folks, and, and even some of the larger clinics where time has been compressed as a result of patients returning. So, um, are you hearing anything about that? And is there anything that um, can be done to help? Well, I'll, I'll just say that um, if there was an application submitted and if there was a request for information, um, we, have, we had one person dedicate 15 minutes at a time to make sure that with different providers along the app, during the application timeframe, to make sure that their questions were all answered. And in some cases, um, you know, walked through filling out the application in real time with them. So um, yeah, I'm, uh, concern acknowledged and um, have done, um, I will never say everything we could possibly do, but we have really worked hard to make sure that anyone that needed help got it. 
I should just say that anecdotally, I have heard, I've spoken with uh, one of the providers, a, a sole proprietor provider who said to me, I said, did you, have you applied? And they said, with our trying to reopen our practice, serve our patients uh, without having dedicated financial people for our sole proprietor staff, we concluded it was just not possible. And then they commented further that we do not know of any of our colleagues who have applied as well. Yeah, under, yeah. Uh, we un understand that. I'll, I'll say that's part of the reason that we have the uh, second opening going back to March 1st so that all providers, if they weren't unable to get through because of the reopening, as you stated, uh, just Trevor, they, they could, um, you know, I, you know, I probably all of our calendars look the same, but I, I was just sharing mine with someone. It's like generally triple booked. So I can just totally understand the feeling of overwhelm. And that's, that was, as I said, that's why we can, are having a longer opening period for the second trial. Can I make a suggestion? I mean, uh, so these practices have been shut down sometimes for days on end without income. Uh, <laughs> I think let's make a suggestion that they shut down for one day that's reimbursable through the grant so that they have time to go through and, and make the grant application. I, I mean, something's got to give because these people really do need the support. And some of them have, I, that I've talked with at least, um, are not wanting to stay in business. So if there's a way that we could say, you get a full day of reimbursement for filling out the grant if you are a, a independent or a small but single proprietor can you do that let's take let's take let we'll take that away and look at that okay. i mean the the um sounds like a really reasonable compassionate sort of approach to Cost to money. a problem <laughs> uh i think that this just really uh shines a light on the challenge that we have been facing. We wanted to get these apps in, get them processed and get them out. Uh, as we uh, regularly consulted with um, GuideHouse, which has been helping the uh, agency of the administration and the state on making sure that the money that goes out does not have to be given back. Um, we have been not only um, becoming clearer about the rules, that, of course, but also um, the level of audit that we have had to employ um, in just this program alone. Um, you know, I think we would probably have had the goal of 15% audit, sort of like, yeah, these are mostly coming in, but we're literally at probably 85% audit. So you're, we're, that's why that chart, I mean, Rep Lipper, you were kind of looking at it going, so what do these different things mean? You know, we have initial review, we have a second review, then we, you know, if there are any discrepancies in those two reviews, then we have to ask for more information. And that's that provider delay. Um, but we, you know, we have to do that. We have to really second, uh, take a second look at most of these applications. And so um, I'm, I'm doing two things here. I'm telling you some of the challenges, but I'm also telling you, that sounds like a great idea. We could run into another, you know, yeah. compliance <laughs> issue. If it, if it doesn't happen, I think that's, that would be the reason. It wouldn't be in opposition to a good idea. Okay, thank you. I've got three questions that I can see. Um, we'll start with Representative Donahue, and then we'll go to Representative Durfee, and then Representative Smith, so in that order. So, uh, Anne, you're up. the line. The other two were ahead of me. I don't wanna... Oh, they were, oh. okay. Well, then uh, I'll reverse order. I did not see the order. Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Donahue. Uh, uh, could, could I see that chart again, the hospital appropriations? There we go. <clears throat> it's quite apparent to me which hospitals in Vermont are the most important and the ones that are the least important when I'm seeing $32 million going to Burlington. I don't see North Country Hospital on there at all. And I'd like to know why. Maybe they didn't apply for this, but I, I bet they did. 
And I'd like to know why there's no funds coming to one of the two hospitals up here. So I'll, I'll start maybe and just say that it, this is a needs-based application process per the legislative language. And it is also um, the inputs lead to a funding formula that leads to these funding recommendations. And so that's why um, the award amounts are in the, the way that they are. It is actually very mathematical once we receive all the inputs and validate the documentation. Ina, I will defer to you about North Country Hospital. I, thank you for the question. I, I wanted to raise this issue uh, relative to the last discussion about, about the application and whether or not smaller providers um, found the application daunting and, and that was a factor in their decision not to apply. What I wanted to point out was that we've seen both uh, smaller providers certainly may not have um, come in for this funding, but we've also seen that what we would consider to be large providers with sophisticated um, accounting uh, arms of their business also did not apply. So uh, Rep Representative Smith, specifically, we didn't receive an application from North Country, and that's why they are not here uh, in this funding disbursement. We only received nine applications from Vermont's 14 hospitals. We do understand that it's likely that hospitals that did not apply may, may apply in the second cycle of funding. Um, some of those uh, considerations for them may have been the concurrent application process with their budget preparation for their annual Green Mountain Care Board review, for instance. Um, that's something we can surmise, but it, we, ha we, um, we have seen larger providers that also did not uh, apply for funding. And what about Springfield Hospital received nothing, as did Copley Hospital in Marshville. Uh, can you tell me how much they applied for? The application does not uh, ask the application is a formula that does not include the hospitals asking for a specific amount. The, because this is a needs-based distribution of funding, the application looks at the losses that hospitals have, ex I'll, I'll give a very broad brush explanation. The application looks at the revenue losses that the providers experienced during the eligible period, which was to June 15th. It looks at the increased expenses that providers experienced also during that time that are directly attributable to COVID-19. Um, and the application looks at the funding that providers have received elsewhere from other sources to offset those expenses and losses. And in the instances where you're seeing the zero award amount, it means that through the formula, the losses and expenses experienced by these hospitals are not greater than the other assistance that they've already received. And so therefore there is not an award amount for these hospitals. Thank you. It, it looks to me like we, take, we put too much faith in a formula. Uh, yeah, but can I uh, add one data point to that as well? Um, the rural hospitals got greater proportional federal uh, assistance as well. There were, I believe there were almost two uh, distributions to uh, Medicare hospitals, then to rural hospitals. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not positive of that, but I do know that rural hospitals got a, 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 a solid um, uh, federal distribution compared to other types of hospitals. I, I, the other piece is just uh, uh, hospitals did a lot in term as uh, utilization dropped, they did a lot to manage their expenses. So there was furloughing going on. Um, and so that, that contributes to the outcomes as well. All right, thank you. Yeah. That's all I have. Okay, uh, Representative uh, Durfee. Yes, thanks. And I'm not sure if it was Sarah who was uh, speaking at this point, but you referred to, uh, someone referred to FEMA eligible 
organizations and a process they would have to go through. I, can, can you explain a little bit more what that means and, and who those organizations might be? Are they hospitals? Or are they the smaller, the independents? Yes, that was me. Um, so there are, our estimates are um, working closely with the Department of Public Safety, who is the single state agency for FEMA. So they're kind of the FEMA experts. There are roughly 34 healthcare providers that are um, FEMA eligible applicants. I would say that those primarily, like all of the hospitals are considered FEMA eligible, but there are other organizations beyond just hospitals. And it has to do with the, their kind of role um, in providing a critical service through the pandemic in terms of whether they are FEMA eligible organizations or not. In addition, there's also FEMA eligible expenditures. And so, which are also kind of very, closely defined by FEMA and DPS. And so not only do you have to be an eligible FEMA applicant, you also have to have incurred eligible FEMA expenses. And there is um, an application process to FEMA. FEMA does provide 75% funding to all eligible applicants, all eligible expenses. Um, the Coronavirus Relief Fund is providing the 25% state match that is part of the tre US Treasury's Coronavirus Relief Fund guidelines that you can use CRF as the match on FEMA. And so as we went through this application process for any of the applicants that could potentially be receiving FEMA funds, we issued an award for only 25% of those potentially FEMA allowable expenses then that organization will have to go through the FEMA portal to get the 75% funding. That is one of the requirements that the state of Vermont has issued governing our federal funds in response to the COVID crisis. The reason for that is it allows us to maximize our use of federal dollars. <laughs> I will say that as we look to what's needed um, and our estimates of expenditures for this program, we are holding a reserve um, for any of these um, FEMA eligible applicants in case they don't receive the 75% FEMA award. Because I think, it, and I'm not an expert on FEMA, I think it is, could be a relatively complex process. There are resources, Guidehouse is helping these, ap these applicants go through the FEMA portal, so there is technical assistance for that. But in case they don't receive that 75%, funding from FEMA, our intent is to provide coronavirus relief funds for those expenses. Great, good. Thanks for that explanation. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I want to be very uh, aware of our time. Uh, Senate Health and Welfare is going to have to leave within the next five minutes, but we have three more hands up and I want to make sure that those questions get asked to McCormick and then Representative Page. So uh, Representative Donahue. Uh, thank you and um, I apologize if this question was already answered. I had, was distracted by some IT problems. I, I didn't see anywhere um, on the list um, applications from or awards to any of the designated agencies? Did none of them apply or are they in a smaller subcategory that's not broken out? Representative Donahue, they did apply through this process um, and their applications are, are still under review. Um, they are another example um, of FEMA eligible applicants. And so that is a complicating factor for them. But I will say this week we have a focused review team looking at the applications to be to be able to make award determinations for the DAs and the SSAs. So that they're not reflected in the uh, what was it 95 million that's 98 million that's been reviewed and approved that would be an additional amount. So I should clarify that 98 million is an estimate of what we think we're going to issue potentially in awards this first round. It has not been all reviewed and approved. They are included in a bucket, um, the 25.6 million that's still under review. There is a, a portion of that that is the DAs and the SSAs. Okay, so it would be as part of the 98, in other words. Correct. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, Senator McCormick.
You're muted, Senator. Sorry. Uh, the comment was already made that, that, that uh, Springfield got, got zero, uh, presumably because of, of money they've already gotten. But the money they've already gotten was because they were on the edge of bankrupt. Well, in fact, are bankrupt. Right. And, and I'm wondering, uh, yeah, they, they've declared bankruptcy. And uh, I'm wondering if um, uh, that was taken into consideration, if the fact that the money they've already gotten speaks to a particular situation. That's my question. Senator McCormick, similar to other hospitals, Springfield did receive um, support from the federal government, not just limited to their kind of bankruptcy status, but as oh, part okay. of the overall relief that came from the federal government. And I will note, oh, okay. related to your question, I, I am seeing on the chat similar questions wanting to get an understanding across the providers of how much other relief um, they've received. So really like the inputs into our formula, which which are very kind of telling as you look at those details. Okay. So I've Thank noted you. the question and, and taken it as a, to, to take back and get that information. So the, mon the, the other monies were monies other than the aid they were given with their <laughs> underlying problems. Okay. Thank you. That, that's a very good question. And uh, it would be great to get uh, information back. Uh, I think Representative Page was next. Well, I think Sarah has already uh, uh, responded to what Senator Westman's uh, um, thoughts were, as well as my own. I'd like to have a look at those uh, to see what funds have been provided previously and compare that to what the chart that you just showed, Senator, uh, or uh, excuse me, I promoted Representative Brian Smith. Um, so that would be very helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, can I, you know, I'll just add a comment on that. I believe that at one point we heard from the Green Mountain Care Board, or perhaps it was from you folks on uh, monies that hospitals have received from the federal government. Um, I'll have to go back and look through, but um, th it would be very helpful to get all of that in a broad, broader context. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions? This has been very helpful uh, and really appreciate the time that you've taken to bring us this information. I know that there are a lot of, a lot of questions that we have that we'd like to dig down further into the weeds and uh, know more. Uh, but this is, I think this, this is the, where the place we need to be right now. All right, can, can I suggest, I don't know, given sure. everything that's on our plates over the next, between now and adjournment, but I, I do think it's at some point it's going to be important for us to be able to look at this in uh, with more time time available to our committees to understand and ask questions. I yes, well we can talk about doing that perhaps next week sometime. If that's Just possible. Seeing how long we're around. Right. Okay. All right. So um, at this point, I think we're going to switch gears. And we, and we, we, we will leave. We will leave your Zoom. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all for being with us. We, we enjoy okay. it. Okay. Thank you. And, uh, I'm going to suggest Thank that you. we, uh, so I just, just to acknowledge that there have been several people who uh, apparently who requested to be on the background in Zoom in order to be able to hear us uh, live. Uh, and I, um, I think it's important that we did that. But uh, we, we, the House Health Care Committee members should sign off so that the Senate Health and Welfare can, can, can proceed with their other business. Okay, thank you very much and uh, take you. care everyone. We're, Senate Health and Welfare will continue on. Thank you, Ina, Sarah, and Corey. If you want to stay on, you're welcome. <laughs> oh, shucks. <laughs> okay. Senator Weston made him put on a tie and everything. <laughs> I know. Told well, him not to. I just pointed out that he didn't have one. You made him feel guilty. <laughs> we're, we're still we're still being recorded for live display. So, okay, um, we are moving on to the child care financial assistant aid for providers overview from Sarah Treckle and Commissioner Brown. And welcome, Commissioner Brown. I know you and I have been playing phone tag, and apologize for not being able to have a conversation ahead of time, but here we are. 
My apologies as well. Don't apologize. I, I know what life is like. <laughs> it's like good. Do we have anything in, from you um, online for this? Um, we, we do not. Earlier this week, we did testify in House Human Services in this area, um, and we provided a yeah. chart. And unfortunately, um, as uh, we were reviewing and approving the award letters for the Parent Child Centers, um, I noticed a discrepancy between uh, what we were uh, granting out and what the chart had for data. And so we reviewed that chart and we found some calculation errors. And so it's over inflating some of the numbers and make, um, and so we are re-verifying and rerunning that spreadsheet and we will provide an update to the committee when we're through that process. So we're unfortunately not able to share that data with the committee this morning. Uh, are there implications to that in terms of uh, awards being granted? Does um, that influence? Well, it, in terms of, um, you know, in the testimony that in the data we provided to the House Human Services, um, it, it, it seemed like we had a very large denial rate for what was requested versus what we approved. And some of that was due to an inflated number we found in a calculation that made it seem like they requested more funds than they did. And so as a result, the, that is going to change and the approval rate will go up considerably. And so, which is, I think, a point of concern among the PCCs right now from that testimony. And so um, you will see that the, the approval rate will go up significantly once we verify and update that data. Okay, because the, the, thank you for this. This is an important conversation. I think the, the questions that I've received, the, the greatest number of questions and the most compelling have been around uh, the Parent Child Center awards. Mm -hmm. And can you, uh, it would be helpful for you um, at, because we are being recorded, this will go out online uh, on YouTube for everyone. Can you, explain one more time what what the glitch is why there are apparently lower um awards yes or, we found a miscalculation what's uh, happening yeah we found some miscalculations in the spreadsheet that we were using to track and compile the data and so that miscalculation made it appear that there was um significantly more funds requested than there actually were and then the approval data seemed accurate, but what that did is it inflated then the denial rate or the approval rate. And so it made it seem like we, we only approved a small portion of the request. And what triggered us to look at that is the other day when I was signing the award letters for the parent child centers, um, in terms of for the expenses up through the application deadline, not uh, anticipated expenses, but actual incurred through the end of August, we'd approved 90% of those requests in those award letters. And so that gave, that was a signal to me that something wasn't right in the spreadsheet. And so we've been reevaluating and found some errors and we're recalculating and verifying that data this morning. Thank you. Uh, this I think will be somewhat reassuring uh, to the people I've heard from I think the, the, the somewhat uh, extends to the question about their survivability, yes, <laughs> their sustainability yes. right now. Yeah. They're feeling very um, pressed yeah, for resources. So thank yeah. you for that. And so uh, maybe and, there's and, some hope. And for further that. information for the committee, we are re just, to, just to reaffirm everything, we're re-reviewing those 14 requests today just to, to double verify and we'll be reaching out to the parent child centers individually after that review and having a conversation to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, and then also to have a conversation to give them more certain uh, uh, certainty on their future um, expenses as well and what will be eligible. Cause I think there was some miscommunication around that on, on, on uh, our earlier testimony this week as well. And I just want to give them some assurances that um, they'll, They'll, what's going to be reimbursable or not so they can make those expenditures in a timely manner to support their operations. So. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Questions committee on this topic? I know we've all probably received communications regarding PCCs. 
Okay. Um, can we can we talk about the CCFAP? The the child care. Um, yes. Are you uh, the hazard pay piece? Well, uh, hazard pay, but we also have. Um, Nolan Langwell is here only until 1030. And um, can I ask, Nolan, can I ask you to walk through the um, CCFAP with us a little bit and then we can talk about that and then also talk about the hazard pay piece as well. Sure. Um, for the record, Nolan Langwell, the Joint Fiscal Office. <coughs> the, um, <excuse coughs> the piece that I was going to talk about or highlight for the committee was to help is the, the piece that we're talking about, the budget proposals in DCF. And one thing that had come out on the House was a, kind of some confusion about the CCFAP move, the eligibility move. So I had worked with Sarah to try to, uh, Sarah Truckle to try to lay it out in a way that was a little cleaner for members to understand. Um, and I don't know if, um, if I have access or if Nellie wants to post it. Uh, do I, I don't know if I have access. Do I have access? Oh, I guess you, I you're you do. Host. You do. Okay. okay. You're good. All right. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and it should be online. But what we tried to do here was try to lay out two pieces, two numbers that I want to flag. At the top is this is the, the 662,727. That's the total impact that the providers will feel um, from moving from this particular piece. So they'll see a reduction in $662,000 by, by no longer providing this particular service. Um, if you go down to, if I lower the bottom, that, that's, that's gross because that's the, they get the state and the federal combined. So they're just feeling the gross piece. The budgetary impact on this is $613,000. That's the general fund savings from this. The reason why it's all lumped together is because in the ups and downs in the budget, there's, there's multiple components that go into this proposal. And so when you're looking at it from the budgetary standpoint, there's a piece here and a piece there, but they're not all together. And so what this does is this tries to just lump it together saying, this is what the proposal looks like. So you either do all of it or none of it, because this is all the, the moving pieces that go into this particular proposal. And their proposal basically, the, the reduction would save uh, $613,000. Now, just so you know, the House uh, rejected that proposal and put that money back into the budget. They did not like this proposal. So the budget that you, uh, that has come up from the House rejects the DCF's proposal to do this. So with this, again, this handout is just an attempt to try to explain or help people understand the numbers better. Um, I think also, and Senator Westman, correct me, or Senator McCormick, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the Senate also rejected this proposal. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Okay. So. Um, so we're after the fact. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that's, but this is very helpful. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Nolan, for putting this together. It, uh, it, it's, well, is it understandable? At first, you have to really study it for a bit, but um, it is extremely helpful. Uh, That's why I say you really have to look at the, only those two numbers. And, and I want to thank yeah. Sarah again for their help on and helping me put this together. They were very, super helpful Good. in working on this. So. Sure. Uh, Sarah or Commissioner uh, Sean, Commissioner Brown, uh, do you want to make so, any comments on this? I know we've talked about it before. Yes, we have um, uh, uh, discussed this in, in committee previously. Um, and it is, as Nolan indicated, this is a very complicated financial proposal in terms of how the funding and the movement of money and the different debt IDs works. Um, so I really appreciate uh, his work with Sarah to kind of lay it out here and explain it in the way he did. Um, Nolan is correct that um, the House undid this proposal in the governor's recommended budget, and, the, and I believe the Senate budget does as well. Um, and um, we certainly appreciate um, the committee's thinking, you know, the both chambers thinking and, and the rationale for doing that. Um, and, and we do not have uh, any objection to that um, um, being restored in the budget moving forward. And, you know, and based on the committee discussions, 
we've kind of put we we kind of put on hold any preparation plans in terms of the, the staff that would have been impacted. We didn't start the process for any reductions in force that would have occurred. And so understanding where it looked like both both chambers were going with this proposal. Okay, good. Thank you. That's helpful. I think and it's also consistent with what this committee had um, yes. sort of decided along yeah. the way. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Nolan, anything else? Nope. That's nope. great. Thank you. And thanks for being here. We'll, right. we'll give you six minutes. Uh, okay, so um, let's move on to the child care financial assistant uh, assistance uh, for providers for, and then the hazard pay issue. Go back to any your, the comments that you were prepared to give us. Yes, um, and so we did testify um, um, uh, in this earlier in the house as well. Um, this proposal originated um, with Let's Grow Kids. Um, indicating that uh, child care workers have been left out of some of the earlier uh, hazard pay uh, bills uh, passed by the legislature and into law. Um, and with the understanding that this conversation took on new urgency as we stood up the online learning hubs for school age kids and, and, um, to, and to recruit a workforce very quickly, the, uh, uh, the bonuses that were being provided uh, for new staff coming on to help support those. There, uh, we certainly had a concern that we did not want to destabilize the existing child care system and having staff who, who um, staff the zero to five age child care system out there moving to these online hubs. And so um, Let's Grow Kids um, put forth this proposal in the Senate. Um, we support it. Um, uh, we recognize that uh, child care providers um, from the early days of the pandemic and through the summer and even now um, have stayed open and available um, to, to serve uh, the urgent need for child care for first responders and health care workers and, and other critical uh, staff around the state for services. And so I think this recognizes those contributions and the risk involved in that and um, with the pandemic. And so we do support um, this proposal. Okay. Uh, questions committee for Commissioner Brown. Okay. Um, Senator Westman, Senator McCormick, um, is there, can you give us, do you have a quick update for what is in the budget currently around this? Or is this going into the hazard pay bill? Do you know Commissioner yeah, Brown? Um, or oh, go ahead, Dick. Yeah. No, I, w I was just going to say I was going to defer to Rich. <laughs> um, essential retailers who. Okay. Uh, he's he's drifting off. Uh, Commissioner Brown, it, is it your understanding that this is in the hazard pay bill, going yeah, in the hazard pay bill? Or well, is it my understanding is some of, the, of, of it is included in an amendment to S-353. That's what I thought, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. All right, and I think our committee does not have a problem with this. Unless I hear differently. Okay, any other questions for the commissioner or for Sarah? Uh, it would be extremely helpful if you could keep us up to date. Um, you, could, you can send a, an email out to the committee as a whole and include Nelly uh, in that, our committee assistant in that, and we will be able to post information that you send us onto our web page so that it's available for folks because we're getting a lot of questions mm -hmm. in particular around parent child centers and it would be helpful to know that the glitch is fixed and what the outcome of that is in terms of expenditures to specific um, PCCs. So getting yeah. the, the chart, the list and the uh, similar to what we saw earlier from Sarah Clark Mm -hmm. on the um, the stabilization grant for providers. We absolutely, we, we will provide that to the committee. And again, um, you know, 
we regret the um, alarm that, that this data glitch has created and caused, and we're working behind the scenes to uh, provide the, the accurate and up-to-date data, and we'll be working closely with the PCCs today to make sure okay. they understand where, where, where they stand. I, the, the question that I have that, that is gonna, the question that I've asked earlier and uh, understanding that the PCCs are trying to work as a network mm -hmm. and uh, have distribution of resources through the network, is that something that's being considered and is that allowable under the federal guidance uh, and uh, so that? Well, there's there's the federal guidance, and then there was also the the legislation allocating these funds and for what purposes. And so we'll certainly look at that. But my understanding is based on it was to reimburse them for cost and and expenses and loss of revenue incurred due to COVID. That that would look different for each organization, and that's why it's an individual application process. Um, but we certainly want to be consistent in how we review and consider similar cost across the parent-child centers. And so we certainly would be consistent in that way and uniform in that way. Okay, thank you. Um, I think going forward, we're probably gonna have to consider some relationship with the network itself and how that might um, play out. Mm -hmm. But next question, that'll be the next step. Mm -hmm. Okay, committee questions on any of this for the commissioner, and then we'll, we're going to give him some time off. No questions? Yes, I just... Senator Ingram. Right. So, um, so I was just wondering if um, the commissioner is confident that the, the glitch is, is being fixed uh, uh, correctly, and I mean, it, 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 is it... Um, uh, you've got all your all your folks doubling down on it. Um, I know it's a you know concern to, of course. Oh yeah, yes, we're right. working very hard. Um, throughout, we will be working very hard throughout the day to verify. I want to make sure the numbers we do release um, in response to this are accurate and up to date and current and reflect the awards that will be going out to each parent child center for their for their. Uh, Cost and expenses. So you anticipate it being uh, corrected by we'll, the end of this week. Or? By the end of the by the end of the day for the parent child centers, yes. By the end of the end of today. Yes. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, yeah. thank yeah, you. I've asked those staff working on this who are teleworking to come into the office this morning so we can huddle in a socially appropriate, distanced way, but to uh, you know work through each request and make sure all the numbers are accurately reflected in the spreadsheet. So when we provide updated information, it's, it's current and accurate. Great, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else? All right, this is very helpful. Um, thank you for taking the time to be with us and um, clarifying the questions that we have, the, mm -hmm. giving us some answers. Um, anything else committee for Commissioner and Sarah. Okay, uh, what I'm gonna suggest is that we move on. I, I do have a question, uh, a discussion question for the committee based on the, the work that was done on uh, H611, the older Vermonters bill. So um, Commissioner, you are free to go. Yes, thank, thank Unless you. Unless you want thank to stay. The, I mean, no, I got, I got some work to do here. Thank you for the opportunity this morning. All right, thank Come you. On. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, we have some time before our next topic, and uh, but I wanted to ask about 611 because uh, the, the change that was made to six, we, I've had a question about why hearing wasn't included, but dental health was. Was there a discussion about that last Friday when uh, my internet went out? No. No, no. Okay. I don't believe so. I don't recall that. If there yeah, was, the, I, the I, difficult, I don't recall. Okay. I think the difficulty with this one is that hearing is seen as the physical health generally. 
and it makes it really difficult. We know that as we get older, there are certain develop uh, during each developmental stage, there are specific healthcare needs. And one of the ones that really stands out, and it stands out to me and something I've been concerned about for many years, uh, and shows how far I've been able to get, introducing bills is about it, um, <laughs> in having uh, hearing aids covered uh, and, and treatment for hearing loss covered at least a mod you know, some portion of that covered in healthcare dollars. Uh, so I think that the concern that we're hearing from others is that concern and why isn't it expressed in the Older Vermonters Act? Mm -hmm. I think the Older Vermonters Act for me, if I can answer that question, and I, and I don't know whether it's a satisfactory question for anyone, including myself, but uh, this bill is more about establishing broad systemic policies and building a cohesive system across state government uh, rather than identifying individual <coughs> developmental needs. So the next step, I think, is to, um, is to build uh, from the broader system. And so we can look forward to this discussion going forward. Yes, was uh, wasn't it, Senator Ayer, that you always said that uh, healthcare stopped at your neck? <laughs> of course, right, that's it. Right. it and, uh, well, which is why having dental in there is a good thing, because at least we can begin to think about dentures and, and dental care that older Vermonters are sometimes lax in, in uh, getting. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, committee, our next topic doesn't begin until 11 o'clock. Oh, I'm sorry. May I ask another question about 611? Absolutely. You're the reporter. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I was just wondering, process-wise, where it, I I guess that it was sent to approves because of the um, per DMs for for the working group. Okay. And is the probes going to be able to? Uh, I I feel bad because I know they're overburdened. But well, do we think that'll come out pretty soon? Now that you've done. Senator Westman. I, I think um, uh, we talked about it on, um, um, and I think um, it sounded like maybe Friday. Okay, great. It sounded like Friday. Um, um, I can't, don't want to be held to that, but what, it's what it sounded like to me. Does that mean, does that mean Friday it'll be um, at, on the floor at 1130? It'll be No, up I thought appropriations would take it up because, um, um, you know, with the floor report today at noon and having to report the appropriations bill this afternoon, I think um, our committee's not going to really meet in, this afternoon, but Friday, so Friday would be the first time that we would meet. Okay. All right. So, Debbie, it looks like you're off the hook until... Tuesday. I mean, I have had, I have communicated with the House and it does sound like they are going to concur with the bill as we propose it, which is a good thing, but it also is going to take them some time. So the sooner this can get on the floor, the better. If there's any way to pop that out for tomorrow for a floor report, that will, that would be extremely helpful. And I, I don't know how you do that given where appropriations is and has been. I know it's been a, a nightmare in some respects. Yeah. <laughs> Not unless they meet Friday morning for, yeah. Well, if there were, yeah, if there were a quick the meeting, floor. I don't know, maybe you can accelerate that process, but I, I, we will understand if it doesn't happen. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, the other, the other issue is, and then we're, we are going to take a little bit of a break, but, um, You'll notice that it, uh, there is a proposal, um, there may be a proposal of amendment on H-795. Um, this, uh, that we can look at, it relates to the public records access uh, section and the language of that, maybe to make it more, um, to consolidate it somewhat. Uh, Jen is looking at it. Um, uh, and along with others, and, and I'm hoping, including Tucker Anderson, who's our expert in that area, our ledge counsel in that area. 
uh, so we'll look at that and see whether or not we would want to have a, a proposal of amendment offered. Uh, I think it makes sense for us to be the ones to do that. If there's any change to be made to make it as expeditiously as possible so that the uh, House committee doesn't have to um, do that on its own. They've, they've been looking at this as well. So it's not like it's coming out of the blue. It's the house is also interested. All right. And then a proposal of amendment from Senator Ballant uh, regarding the um, public safety mental health issue. And a question for Senator Westman and Senator McCormick. The money did flow to the public safe to public safety in the budget. The Senate, the difference between Senate and House is money goes to public safety in the Senate and to the mental health in the House. Is that right? Yeah. Is there any language, is there language in the bill consistent with what the House offered on uh, establishing uh, a broader systemic approach in the future? Is that also in the Senate bill? Ask your question again, Jenny. I didn't so there was language that the House sent over recommending that um, that as um, a, a, a look across the state at all the programs that are offered for integration between mental health uh, and public safety, whether it's state police or local, uh, at going forward in the future to look at components of the system and how the system would be uh, influenced. I'm not saying that well. Yeah, I think we get what you mean. You Is know, there I, language in the budget for that? I, I haven't looked that far yet. I don't think there is. Do you uh, think, Dick? I would have to ferret through my notes. I mean, we've had dealt with so much. I, I remember the discussion of, of wh whether, where the emphasis should be. But um, Jenny, I'd need to get back to you on that. Okay, I'll go look at the budget myself and look at the language. Well, I think, I mean, for for me, per uh, as a as a member of this committee, I think our the, our committee uh, really um, yesterday as we were talking, we said how important for the three of us who were uh, on the Zoom we said how important it was that this be considered as a mental health issue rather than a public safety issue. I, the, yeah. doesn't, the money can go to public safety. I think they're perfectly capable of utilizing it effectively, but having that uh, MOU between Department of Mental Health and uh, public safety, I think is, uh, is an important one. So I don't know where that is. And yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the argument on the other side, though, Jenny, was, was that you want to integrate mental health into police work, that there are times when police officers are called upon to do mental health work. That, that, really that's not the issue. That is not the issue. That, that, that's absolutely categorically correct. You are absolutely right. And having mental Put health <laughs> services integrated with public safety is key. Yeah. But having uh, standards and criteria and oversight from uh, the healthcare world, I think, is also important. This isn't a public safe. Uh, mental health counselors are not public safety <laughs> people. No, but, but the uh, the argument was was that they are or ought to be involved in public what are now public safety. So, someone is behaving in a bizarre way and perhaps a frightening way. And someone calls nine one one. Okay, that's that's public, and that's what people are going to do. Right. You know, we're, we're with you on that. We're with okay. you on that. We're totally with you on that. And we, you know, if we see community service pro, uh, municipal programs uh, through public safety at the local level, uh, those programs are highly effective with social workers and other counselors. And now yeah. we're talking about state police, and we know that the counselors are very well trained in mental health areas, but we're talking about a significant amount of public dollars going forward, and how, oh, yeah. do, we, how do we coordinate that? My concern is, if you look at the Department of Corrections health care, and you see how it has become segregated from the real world of health care, maybe that's a good thing, um, 
the, the delivery system is, is different. And we want to make sure that we have an integrated system. Uh, so uh, I'll leave yeah. it at that. We'll, we'll, we can put it on the agenda at some point. All right. Let's take Rich, a, let's Rich take... did I, in your view, did I do justice to that issue or in I, your perspective? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, you, you both oh. made your points in. Yeah. In, in, yeah. In, well, it's not, I think, I, I think that uh, sending the money over to public safety is a good thing and having them establish a relationship with the Howard Center or Washington County Mental Health or others is also a good thing. But as we look, go I'm, ahead. We're just, I just say, I think that's long overdue. Yeah. But, <laughs> but the formal relationship between those organizations um, and how that looks is, um, I think, an appropriate question. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So we'll deal with that at some point. And I know that it's not, it isn't forgotten uh, in appropriations, at least I hope not. Okay. Uh, any other issues that we need to take up? So uh, we're back on at 11? We are. Come back on in 10 minutes at 10.55, at if you don't mind, and then we'll be uh, set up and ready to go. I'm just going to mute everything and not go off. Right. Yeah. Te Nellie, technically, uh, we don't leave the meeting. We just... No, no. We're still recording. Okay. Nellie, put you, can you put the screen up, and then we will uh, take our, uh, our mute. We'll mute our... I'll pause everything. All right, we are recording. All right, thank you. And Jen, uh, thanks for being here. And I know there are others who are interested in this topic. And Nellie, you might receive requests from people to, to log on. Just let me know and, and we'll make sure that people get into the meeting if, that's, if they have that desire. Um, because we are recording and YouTube is still not um, efficient at this point. All right, Jen, can you please show us the potential amendment to H795 with the markup? Yes, I think maybe it would be helpful to, to give a little bit of context for, for what this is. Um, so the amendments, um, and, and this is a, what you'll see is a modified version of what was up yesterday, um, are making some changes to the Confidentiality and Public Records Act exemptions for um, the material to be submitted to the Green Mountain Care Board in the context of hospital sustainability planning, uh, health insurance rate review, and hospital budgets. Um, so I will now put up, so what I'm gonna show you first is a markup version um, and with Apologies to Senator McCormick, it's in a few different colors, um, but I'll we'll walk through it. Um, so, um, so the green is um, because I made additional changes after feedback from the Green Mountain Care Board, who um, they suggested a more streamlined and straightforward approach um, to making the changes that we were looking at. So the first, first thing that would be affected here is in hospital sustainability planning. Um, and it would just simply take out the language saying that information submitted by the hospitals uh, would be exempt from inspection and copying under the Public Records Act and kept confidential. The upshot of this is that, and then there were some exceptions. The upshot of this is that it would be subject to the same Public Records Act um, exemptions and balancing tests as exist, uh, would otherwise exist in the law. So it's not creating anything different. So things that are trade secrets or our confidential business information um, could be withheld uh, under an exception to the Public Records Act, but the board would have to undertake the, um, <clears throat> the balancing test to determine the public's interest versus the, in, in uh, seeing the documents versus the hospital's interest in keeping them confidential. So that is the first potential change. The second one appears in the, um, in section six, which is the health insurance rate review section. 
Um, and this would give some, um, some narrowing and, and maintain, the, um, maintain the confidentiality in the same context as what the Public Records Act does. So this would tie it into the existing um, Public Records Act exception around confidential business information and trade secrets. Um, so this would still require insurers upon request to provide the board with detailed information about their payments to specific providers, and then would specify that confidential business information and trade secrets received from an insurer under this subdivision would be exempt from public inspection and copying under, and then it cites to the specific Public Records Act exception for confidential business information and trade secrets and kept confidential except that the board may disclose or release information publicly in summary or aggregate form if doing so would not disclose confidential information or business information or trade secrets actually made it business information in the amendment. Um, because we're tying it to an existing exemption we don't need to have language in about um, the, it, this new exemption not remaining in effect or remaining in effect and not being repealed through operation of law. And then we get to the hospital budgets language, hospital budget review. And this would kind of um, narrow, again, narrow the exceptions from the Public Records Act to maintain the, the status quo um, for the most part, which would be that um, information required to be filed in accordance with the hospital budget review subchapter would be, must be made available to the public upon request the citing specifically in accordance with the Public Records Act. And then under existing law, it says, except um, individual patients or healthcare providers shall not be directly or indirectly identifiable. This changes that up a little bit to say that information that directly or indirectly identifies individual patients or healthcare practitioners would be uh, an exception to that disclosure. But this, this then is language that my colleague, Tucker Anderson, who works on Public Records Act issues, wanted me to flag for you, is if you want to just have that information that directly or indirectly identifies individual patients or healthcare providers be kind of automatically redacted and kept confidential without the board having to undertake the balancing test as it relates to that information, then you could put in this, in, this language here in blue that would specify that that information would be kept confidential. Otherwise, it would be subject to the same um, balancing test around public interest and, um, and hospital privacy, or in this case, individual privacy. Um, so it would take out all of the separate language specifying that reimbursement information would, be, uh, would not be made public sensitive financial information and, and subject it all to the standard Public Records Act um, balancing test and, and exemptions list in existing law. So it takes out all of that. It also takes out the language requiring the board to provide guidance on which information would be kept confidential because, again, it would be individualized determinations based on the Public Records Act. I think that's it for changes. So it's, it's um, much easier to see it in the, um, in what I had drafted as an amendment, which I will now put up, but I wanted you to see it in context. Um, so these would be the amendments uh, in the hospital sustainability planning section. It would just strike out that subdivision two in its entirety and make number three, which is about the healthcare advocate getting access to the information, make that number two. Um, the second, and it, I don't think it showed in there, uh, but had to do is just a, a, um, an error on my part. I had left, we'd taken out essential to describe community access to essential services based on a request from the hospital association. And I did that in subsection A, but I forgot I repeated that phrase again in subsection B. So that would just take out essential there to make it consistent. Then in the hospital, uh, I'm sorry, in the health insurance rate review section, uh, it would just clean it up. So just strike out the one that's in there right now and put in this clean version saying confidential business information and trade secrets 
would be exempt from public inspection and copying and kept confidential, uh, except in summary or aggregate form, um, and then would put in a clean version in uh, section nine, the hospital budgets, striking out subsection A as it currently is and putting in instead a new one that would just say, information required to be filed under this subchapter, the hospital budget review subchapter, shall be made available to the public upon request in accordance with the Public Records Act, except that information that directly or identif indirectly identifies individual patients or healthcare practitioners shall be kept confidential. I would take out the that and the shall be kept confidential if you didn't want to do it that way. Um, and then that's, that's it. Okay, so we do? that that's great. I, I think, do we, ha is this, Nellie, can we get these two up on our web page? I believe they are. Okay, that's good. Um, I think that's helpful. I think people out in the real world want to see that. Um, it, so committee uh, discussion, uh, for me, this is a cleaner way of um, looking at the um, confidentiality of information and uh, consistent with the Public Record Act makes a lot of sense. Uh, committee, other questions for Jen? And I see Robin Lunge is here from the Green Mountain Care Board and they've been involved in helping clarify this. Robin, thanks for being with us. Questions for Robin or Jen? Comments? Looks good. Okay. I know we don't deal with the Public Record <laughs> Records yeah. Act all the time. We do deal with HIPAA quite a bit, and but it um, makes sense, I think, to uh, keep this as clean as possible, as streamlined as possible. Okay, Robin, did you want to make any comments, further comments on this? I don't need to unless there's questions for me. I think, um, okay. you know, obviously we, uh, this wasn't our first choice, but we're happy to proceed this way. And um, I think that including the language is helpful. Okay. Uh, yes, it, it's not quite as broad. It doesn't give the board discretion as, uh, as great discretion in making decisions about uh, confidential information. But I think uh, for us, it does adhere to the public records um, statute currently in existence and may give reassurance to uh, people who would like to either access or not have information accessed. Yeah. Definitely. Better. Okay. Committee, this is a proposal of amendment that um, would be offered on H-795. Currently, um, where is it? I don't have it up. I don't have the amendment up. Uh, you, uh, Jen, whoop, whoops, I don't have it. Anyway. Um, Nellie, I'm, I, oh, wait, wait uh, hang on a second, folks. I'm just refreshing my page. Um, there it is. I, so what I was going to say is currently it, it, the, the proposal amendment comes from me. Um, as, as reporter of the bill. And I, I think if the committee members would like to sign on to this, that would be extremely helpful. Do you want to okay. sign on? Sure. Okay, Senator Ingram, Senator McCormick. Yep. Okay, and Senator, that's good. I, I, Senator Cummings is not able to be here today. Um, so let's do it that way, Jen. And then um, uh, if I can get a clean copy of that and uh, send it, I'll send it to the Secretary Bloomer okay. as a proposal of amendment. I don't, uh, I, you know, sometimes people want to see these things for a day before they 
we take them up, but let's, let's see if we can uh, deal with it this afternoon. If not, we'll deal with it tomorrow morning. Did you want that language about um, the, the shall be kept confidential as it relates to the individual? Yes, uh, I think so. Okay. I think that I think that I think that's important. You know, if an individual waives a right to that confidentiality, they can always do that. I know that's that happened in one hospital budget review that Robin uh, shared with us. Okay, I'm going to send this for a quick edit. I will tell okay. them it needs to be quick, um, and then I will get it to you to get to the secretary. Okay, that's good. That's good. So we're all comfortable with that. I'll do my, I, I you know, Ro, uh, Ro, Robin, Jen, <laughs> if there is any way that you can get me a, a quick summary of the amendment, that would be helpful. I, you know, I, I get it, but be sure to get questions. Yes, I'll, I'll work with Tucker on coming up with something. All right, that would be helpful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this, and I know that it was a concern in the House, and I know that the Green Mountain Care Board was deeply engaged in helping us with this one, so we'll do what we can do. All right. We, <laughs> we are early, but sure. um, do you need time to get that work done before... You're not doing the next one, are you? No. I don't think so. What's the next one? Um, no, it isn't. It is on the mental health issue that Katie's been involved in, but Katie's not here. So we'll, we'll just hold off and hear from uh, Department of Mental Health and uh, Senator Ballant on her proposed amend amendment for the uh, big bill. So let's, committee um, and others, uh, we are going to take a 10-minute break. So you have 10 minutes. Nellie, can you put our screen up? And then we will be back at 11.25. Great. I'll pause the recording again. Thank you. And uh, we are recording again. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Senator Ballant, for being here. This, uh, your proposal of amendment would uh, attach to the big bill, H-969. And as we understand it, the Senate position is significantly different from the House position, so that the, the 595000 more or less, dollars would go directly to public safety, not to mental health. And the language that came over from the House on um, the mental health public safety issue or the broader issue, the systemic look in the future, that I, apparently that language is not in the budget. We'll have okay. to clarify that because we, are with, we don't have our ledge council with us. Uh, but the Department of Mental Health is here and they can help us understand what might be there as well. So please present your amendment. Okay, so I will um, wait until Katie's able to take you through um, section by section, but I will talk about what led me to this, if I could, some, some background and why I felt it was important. And of course, I leave it up to you and your committee to figure out how best to, to address this, this issue. So last Friday, the House passed um, the budget and it would allocate um, roughly half a million dollars from the general fund to embed mental health clinicians in state police barracks. And um, since then, I've been in contact with Wilma White, the, um, excuse me, Wilda White, who is the inaugural chair of the Vermont Mental Health Crisis Response Commission. And I know you all know her, she knows you former executive director of Vermont Psychiatric uh, Survivors. So what Wilda and I discussed was how systemic racism operates at the intersection of mental illness. So we've been talking about a lot in terms of the criminal justice, si criminal justice system, but often uh, the mental health system is overlooked in these conversations. So we really wanted to make sure that it was part of this broader conversation that we're having. And it, I'm sure it won't surprise you that the same disparities that we see in other American institutions also appear in mental health systems. So for example, black 
or African Americans are much more likely to be misdiagnosed with schizophrenia, for example. Um, doctors diagnosing it at a much higher rate for black patients, specifically uh, higher for black men, four times as often as for, for white patients, so significant. Um, in Vermont, non-white Vermonters are disproportionately represented in the highest level of involuntary, involuntary hospitalizations. So at Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, for example, 15% of the patients held there are non-white, and that does not reflect the population of non-white uh, Vermonters. So I'm here because um, of our fear of how systemic racism might play out. So I'm saying might, want to be clear, might play out when embedding mental health clinician, clinicians in state police barracks. And I understand what you're saying, Madam Chair, may not take this form, the appropriation may not take this form, um, but it has the potential of being a combustible mix. So resulting in either an increase in racial disparities uh, in diagnosing mental illnesses or an increase in racial disparities in divergence. So with white Vermonters with substance use issues, for example, being diverted away from the criminal justice system, while non-Vermonters with the same issues being processed through the criminal justice system. So the proposal is pretty straightforward, though I'm sure Katie can take you through all the ins and outs, but it's really an amendment directed at making sure the Department of Public Safety and the Department of Mental Health um, are collecting st statistics by race on all the 911 calls that relate to an in individual's perceived mental health condition, because that's where the decisions are being made. Um, their mental or emotional condition, their developmental or intellectual disability, and or complications involving drug or alcohol consumption. So, I know from, from my work, uh, you know, you, you were wonderful, Madam Chair, along with um, your committee of looking at the issue of how disparities play out with maternal health. It's along those same, same lines, is that we cannot assume that we, when we make one tweak in a system that it's gonna play out the same uh, for people across uh, racial experiences here in Vermont. So that's what we're trying to do. I hope it's possible to do this or something like it so we can start tracking the data. Okay, so what we, um, we, what we have um, here is um, your proposal of amendment. You're asking to have data collection as 911 calls are made um, or as people are supported during uh, a mental health crisis through public safety. And then um, the Department of Mental Health collecting data as well as uh, public safety. I'm looking through it. I'm looking at number three. Um, uh, all of these things are things that I think are critically important as we move forward with um, a, a more integrated set of programs across the state, and in particular with our department, our Department of Public Safety at the state level. Um, questions for for Senator Ballant. And, and just FYI, uh, as you may know, as in your conversation with Wilda, we did have her testify. Yes, she uh, said and that. Her yeah, her testimony is always very compelling. Yeah. We're, we're caught here in a situation where we don't have the bill, but we do want to influence what happens going forward. Questions from Senator Ingram, McCormick, or Westman? Okay. I, I hope you're going to take this to appropriations. Um, um, I would think there'd be some sympathy for, you know, this. I, um, I don't know about the details of the tracking and how that would be, but um, I would think that, you know, we'd all be concerned about this. So, and, uh, and uh, so, uh, be, uh, yeah, I think before we get to that next step, um, any other questions? Because I do want to hear from Morning Fox, who was on the Zoom with us. Yeah. Senator McCormick. Thanks. Becca, would you just, just go over briefly again what exactly the bill does about the problem? It's, we're, we're, we're the collecting. You're suggesting. We are collecting data. That's what we're doing. We are tracking yes. 
that's really it. It's pretty straightforward. It is how do we address the problem if we don't, if we're not even able to look at the data and say, how are we getting to the point where the number of people who are uh, involuntarily committed, uh, the racial proportion of, you know, Vermonters in that institution does not reflect the Vermonters on the ground and why, what is leading to that and how do we prevent that from happening? Um, so it is not something that's supposed to be onerous or very expensive. Um, I think given the charge that we've been given from the governor and Susanna Davis around being more aware of these issues, yeah, yeah. it all starts with a lot of it with data collection. So we know what we're, what we're talking about. I think this um, is comparable with the, what we did uh, in collecting data around COVID uh, yeah. treatment at, with the Department of Health. Senator Ingram. Well, it also dovetails with the uh, data that's being collected by law enforcement now, which is um, fairly extensive and um, is um, under the purview of the racial equity panel. Uh, and changes need to be made in that. I introduced a bill about that. Um, but, um, but absolutely, you know, this is just additional data that um, should go into the, into the mix. Okay. Um, Deputy Commissioner Fox, are you on with us? I am. Oh, terrific. And so is Karen going? Uh, we can hear you. There, there you, we can see there you. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> Thanks for being here, a uh, uh, short notice, but um, uh, we understand that there's a difference between the House and the Senate in the budget and the proposed language that's not there. And, uh, before we get to the uh, proposal of amendment, can you answer this question? Regardless of what happens in the budget, will there be an MOU between DMH and public safety? I will, uh, for the record, uh, Morning Fox, Department of Mental Health Deputy Commissioner, uh, and thank you for having me uh, to speak about this because I, I agree with all that's been said so far of the importance of all of this. Uh, and so uh, I'm very happy to be able to speak about it. Uh, in regards to uh, MOUs, uh, I, would, I would assume, not knowing exactly what we're looking at as far as the program, because uh, it seems to be a little bit in flux um, as it's changed from the original DPS proposal of embedded workers to uh, what was recently uh, in the big bill, which kind of took away that language and made it a bit more expansive to kind of programs as developed uh, regionally. Um, and so, but as long as there's going to be a, uh, a collaborative working relationship between uh, law enforcement entities, such as the state police and a designated agency, uh, I would be uh, pretty confident that there would be the need for uh, uh, MOUs that really clarifies the, the roles uh, and the positions and uh, other work of, uh, you know, all of those pieces uh, uh, so that people aren't stepping on each other's toes, if you will, uh, and that we're just making sure that uh, um, all, all of that work is happening uh, not only efficiently and effectively, but uh, uh, in the most appropriate fashions uh, and so that the mental health people are doing mental health work uh, and that the law enforcement is doing law enforcement work and uh, that the two are not uh, um, commingling, if you will, because um, there is that that concern, and I do appreciate that. Uh, so, uh, in fact, I've been working with uh, um, representative from the state police, uh, working on a. Uh, we have a draft MOU at this time. Um, I'm working on trying to get uh, a copy to you all uh, for for your review. Uh, but uh, just to understand that it is, it's a pretty comprehensive document at this point, and so it's still in draft form and. Uh, I just want to try and clean that up a little bit before before getting to you. Oh, that's good. And thank you for that. I, th I think that uh, for, on our side of things, for our part, we are very uh, appreciative of that work and hope that it can go forward. Um, sure. So on, on the proposed amendment uh, that Senator Ballant has brought, uh, comments that you might have. Sure. Sure. Well, I, I wanted to start with uh, by by just commenting that uh, the Department of Mental Health, we we are still in support of uh, the original uh, Department of Public Safety protocol uh, proposal uh, in regards to having 
uh, embedded uh, mental health professionals uh, working with law enforcement um, in, in a co-located uh, fashion. Um, in regards to uh, the amendment, uh, I want to start off by saying I agree with everything that uh, Senator, Senator Ballant, uh, you, Madam Chair, and Senator Ingram, et, et cetera, have all commented on that this is extremely important data um, as we move forward. Uh, Senator Ballant is right uh, in the information that uh, Wilda White presented uh, in regards to uh, the percentages of uh, non-white uh, people being hospitalized in our level one system of care, uh, which is the highest acuity uh, part of our system of care, uh, that they are disproportionately uh, uh, accounted uh, in our system compared to the overall general population of our state. Uh, and so that is an important piece for all of us to not only take note on, but, uh, and I think, you know, what Senator Ballant's uh, proposed amendment is getting at is collecting that data uh, so that we can then clearly move forward in how to uh, start to change uh, the systems uh, that are all interacting together. Uh, and that's mental health, law enforcement, and other social services as well, ADAP services, uh, DALE services, et cetera. Um, in regards to the specific uh, comments, the, the data that's being sought to be collected is, is great data to collect. Uh, there's no, no question there. Uh, some of the, the, the thoughts that we have is uh, just helping folks understand some of the, the potential uh, hurdles that we'll have to get, get through uh, in order to, uh, to use this data. Uh, you know, I think uh, in, uh, in section three, it speaks of a, uh, a vendor chosen by the council with the goals of collecting uniform data. Uh, and uh, in talking with our uh, research and stats folks and our data folks, uh, that could be a tricky thing. Uh, and it's not going to necessarily be just an, an easy thing as we start to bring in data from different places and bring into a central you know, repository, if you will. Uh, and so I just want to make sure people are aware that this is not something that necessarily can be set up uh, uh, in, in short notice. Um, and, uh, you know, so that is it workable? Probably. Uh, and, you know, from, from the conversations I've had with our folks in our research and stats uh, division, it is something that can be set up and done, but it's not something that happens, you know, overnight. And so I think people just need to be aware of that as we, we work on that to, to try and sort those pieces out. Um, and I think an important piece to understand here as well is that the data that's going to be coming in is really going to rely heavily on uh, the individuals who are uh, uh, in these positions. Uh, the, if, if it does go forward with kind of a co-located embedded uh, uh, clinician, if you will, or, or professional, uh, they will, it will be reliant upon that individual in each, in each area to ensure that they're collecting all that data. Uh, you know, the, the race of individuals, uh, I think, you know, there has to be also, I think we have to make note that there may be some folks whose uh, um, that their race is not necessarily apparent just by their skin color, uh, and uh, and so the, that's a, a delicate line uh, for any kind of professional uh, to to go down the road of needing to ask uh, uh, someone's race uh, or something of that sort, uh, similar to asking about gender or anything else. Uh, uh, and so, you know, that's, that's a tricky piece. And so I think there should be some, some expectation that there will be some folks that may not want to give that information. Uh, and that, you know, it's within individuals rights to, to not be able to express what uh, race uh, or ethnicity they, they, they are of, of origin. Uh, <clears throat> the other uh, type of pieces that we're, we're looking at. I, we have some clarifying questions that I think we'll need to kind of work out uh, when we talk about uh, uh, looking at the, no, the number of individuals who are referred who are already a client of a uh, designated agency. I think some of the questions that we'll have will be things like, you know, a client of any part of the agency, uh, a CRT client, uh, an outpatient client, uh, an ADAP client, uh, if they've had one contact, uh, does that make them a client uh, in the past, or is it you know more than one? 
if they had contact in the past but are no longer actively in treatment, does that count? You know, so I think we'll have to sort out those pieces. Uh, it's it's definitely a doable piece, uh, and I think it's it's good information to have. Similar to the information that we look at when we talk about uh, the suicide data. Um, when we look at suicide data and we look at, you know, we do look at have they been connected with a designated mental health agency uh, in, in, in past times because that's, you know, a, a significant piece. Um, as an aside, uh, a significant percentage, uh, the majority of folks who com uh, complete suicide in our state uh, have not had contact or have not been connected with designated mental health agencies. And so that speaks to uh, outreach, that speaks to access, uh, things of that sort. Um, and then I'm going to just speak briefly, and then I'm going to ask uh, our general counsel, Karen Barber, to speak a little bit more about this. But uh, we also have to keep in mind uh, protected health information and who has access to this information. Uh, is, you know, law enforcement really, uh, should they know where someone was referred to? Uh, should they know uh, if they've been a, a past client uh, of a designated agency and you know things of that sort. And so we have to be careful of that. And I also think we'll be able to re report out on this information. Uh, it will take some operationalizing to get, you know, pulling this together and collect that data. And then, you know, the work of the, 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 uh, uh, the data folks or, you know, bean counters, however you want to uh, term it, but that the folks who, to try and extract that data, um, you know, will have to be worked out. Um, and I think you know, we have to be, I just want to be cognizant of the fact that uh, since our population in Vermont is so predominantly Caucasian uh, and that uh, uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color uh, is uh, such a small percentage of our overall population, that there may be times uh, within this that we're unable to report out on uh, on some of these pieces. Um, as an example, if we have, you know, in, in Orange County, a fairly small uh, rural community uh, that has a very small uh, uh, population of people of color, and we note that there was one person or three people, just by by commenting on one or two people who were referred to X or referred to Y, that could potentially be identifiable and that would run us into uh, uh, HIPAA violations. Because uh, it's not just mentioning someone's name, it's that it could potentially be identifiable. Uh, and so, you know, those are some of the kind of the overall uh, pieces that we would uh, uh, be working on and uh, some of the roadblocks that we would have to kind of get around. Uh, but I think I'll, I'll leave it at that for right now. Uh, but. Uh, uh, I thank you for the time, and as I said, I think uh, our general counsel, Karen Barber, can speak a little bit more uh, eloquently uh, about uh, some of the HIPAA uh, pieces that we'll have to uh, uh, be cognizant of. Okay, thank you. Um, and I want to be aware of our time. We have nine minutes left, and I want to make sure that we get to some closure around this, knowing what the timing is for the big bill. But um, Karen, thank you for being here. And uh, just a couple of minutes, if you don't mind, your, your comments on this. And then we might turn to our ledge counsel, Katie McClinn, who's joined us. Sure, uh, for the record, Karen Barber, um, I'm general counsel for the Department of Mental Health. You know, I think as Fox said, the information you're seeking um, is mostly protected health information, which means that, you know, it can't be given in any sort of form that's identifiable. And given that, um, you know, Vermont, as, you know, as, as Deputy Commissioner Fox mentioned, has um, kind of a lower percentage of, um, of individuals that, um, that are non-white, um, it's very likely that there is a lot of data here that you're asking for that the department is not going to be able to provide because it would be identifiable. So, you know, we just wanted to make sure that you are aware that, you know, we can, of course, try to comply with this, but understanding that often probably we wouldn't be able to provide that information. Um, in addition, so the Department of Mental Health doesn't have access, again, because it's protected health information, to know if someone is a client of a DA receiving DS or ADAP services, we wouldn't have that information because again, we wouldn't have a right to it. So when you're asking, you know, where they're referred or if they're a client, just kind of being aware that that's not necessarily the information that the department could provide. 
Um, touching briefly on kind of a, a vendor. Um, so it's, it's pretty complicated to share protected health information. And if you're trying to um, have it in a server that's not kind of part of um, the Agency of Human Services, there's just a lot of kind of legal complications to that. Um, and it wouldn't be something that could be done quickly. You'd really need um, to put a lot of thought into whether or not it's possible, what information could be shared, how it's going to be protected. So want to be really quick, but just, just aware that there's, um, there's, I think, significant HIPAA issues that need to be worked through. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I know Senator McCormick has a question. Um, yep. and, and I want, uh, Katie, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. Um, so Senator McCormick, why don't you ask your question and then I'm going to make a suggestion that includes Thanks. Katie and Karen and Becca and the rest of us. <laughs> I, I recently filled out a candidate for, forum, and one of the questions was, what do you think the state should do about racist, ra racial inequity? And I, I had answered there, I said, well-intentioned white people need to listen to actual people of color, rather than listening to each other and our theories about race. Uh, we need to, so I'm wondering, has anyone from the, the community <laughs> of people of color, uh, Susanna Davis for one, um, um, expressed an opinion on this. Becca, Not you that want... I'm aware of. Okay. So, <laughs> so Senator, this has all moved so quickly because <laughs> as you know, it just, the budget just got um, yeah. voted on the house. Wilda called me literally yesterday morning to talk about this with me. And Wilda is a person of color. She speaks. There's one. <laughs> well, exactly. What I'm saying is no, she comes from a particular many. experience. And so we wanted to get this in front of you as soon as possible before yeah. we, as you know, we're doing a walkthrough at, at noon for the, for the budget, for the Senate. <clears throat> and so time was of the essence. So did, were we able to do absolute due diligence in hearing from stakeholders? I will be the first to admit, absolutely not. So let me comment on that. And then Senator Ingram, you're up next. Um, we have taken testimony on this. The House uh, Healthcare took extensive testimony on this and wrote up a proposal which they uh, put into the budget. That proposal was taken out of the budget. Uh, I think there's a sense of expediency here on, in the Senate to get money out to help uh, embed mental health workers in public safety. I, see, I don't see a problem with that. Yeah, but I, I, I expect to vote for it. I expect to support it. I'm just... Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Can I, let me finish, Senator. But so uh, what I do see a problem with is not having the longer view. I think what, what Senator Ballant has brought us is, a, is another way of looking at the longer view so that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. And so, um, so Senator Ingram, if, if you have a quick question, fine. I want to make a comment before uh, we have to disintegrate. Well, I just had a quick comment, actually. I mean, I've spent years, you know, working with um, advocates who are people of color and represent organizations um, that look at racial justice. And one of the one of the main things they always say is we need to collect more data because. People, can, you know, white people, whoever, cannot refute hard data. Hard you know, data. When, when there's actual, you know, information that they're being discriminated against, it makes makes things much easier. So, I'm glad you. Well, that's an that answer to my question. So, Thank you. Yeah. That's good. Okay, here's my suggestion. My suggestion is, I think, uh, I I don't know how the rest of the committee feels, but I wouldn't mind signing on to a proposal, an amendment that Senator Ballant would carry forward to the Appropriations Committee. I think what probably needs to happen is that there's, that our Ledge Council, Katie McClinn, uh, work with Becca and with Karen Barber of Department of Mental Health to put something together that's realistic, that doesn't uh, fall under HIPAA every time somebody tries to report something. And that sets us on a pathway forward so that when uh, folks come back in January, there's a longer conversation. And I think that this will help build on the work that's been done and will help um, as the MOU goes forward. So 
Uh, I'm happy to sign on, Becca. And if you think that having Katie and Karen work together with you is the way to go. Um, that would be great. It, it's going to be quick. I understand. I'd like to sign on too. Uh, yeah, anyone I'm else want to sign on? Mm -hmm. Senator Ingram? McCormick? Senator so, Westman? So, um, um, Becca, if... Yeah. I would um, hope that you would get a chance to come before the Appropriations Committee. I'd like to hear um, um, more about the HIPAA stuff, yep. but I'm, um, I'm inclined to want to sign on um, as soon as I figure out um, from them yeah. that we're not running right into HIPAA. Right, understood. Right. I think that, that for me is absolutely key. We, uh, we need to do this in a way that uh, doesn't put individuals in jeopardy. And uh, so Absolutely. let's, uh, does, is, Becca, does that, uh, we're putting a, a little bit of work on your shoulders along with Katie and, and Karen. That's, that's all right. I'm eager to okay. do the work. Um, but if I could, Madam Chair, before we leave, I just, I want to make a recommendation. Any group I have to talk to in the last uh, month, I just recommend this book to read before we're back in session. It's called Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents by a wonderful New York Times journalist, Isabel Wilkerson. And once you read it, you will never look at the world the same way again. And so That's this great. is work that is continuing out of that framework. So I appreciate your time very much. Terrific. And I will share with you that uh, my family and I have been reading, uh, in, in addition to uh, having a, a history of working on this issue myself, but my kids have been sharing books around and they're abs it's absolutely great. Uh, this one is on my daughter's reading list. So I'm yeah, going to, it's phenomenal. Oh, I will read it. Yeah. It is. Katie, th does, are you able to help uh, Becca put something together with Karen? Um, yep. I, I don't know how we want to proceed. Um, maybe Senator. <laughs> either. Us a email with a little bit of guidance and we can start working to put something together for you. That sounds great, Katie. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Uh, Senator McCormick. Yeah, I, I expect to, to vote for this um, measure. I, I think probably because the Appropriations Committee is going to have to consider it, that it's like a juror deciding in advance. Of, I think I should not be a co-sponsor, but I just, because I'm going to be sitting in judgment on it in the um, in probes. You can be an advocate for it and approach. I, I will. I will indeed. All right. Well, then, as then a, you can as a, as, on. <laughs> as a member of the committee. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, thank you all. We have reached uh, 12 o'clock. Thank and you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I very much appreciate I'm it. Thrilled that you, I, I'm thrilled you brought this forward, and we look forward to having you uh, speak up in appropriations. Thank you. On our behalf. Okay. Take care. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Okay, Nellie, I think we Thank can you. end recording. All right. I'm uh, ending the recording now.